Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie, and this week, as promised, my Game of Thrones bonus video is going to be all about the Faceless Men. Since we're still pre-Season 5, I'm going to do a history of their order, and then talk about how the show might use them, just based on castings and filming locations we've seen so far. They're a religious society that worships the many-faced god and engages in the trade of assassination. It's part of their worship. So whenever you join their order, you're not just learning to kill people, you're learning to serve the many-faced god. So far on the show, the best look we've gotten at an actual faceless man is Jack and Hagar. He's a devout religious assassin, which is why he speaks in backwards riddles. At the other end of the spectrum, you can think about the common assassin, like Carl, played by Bern Gorman this last season in season 4. He was an assassin in King's Landing. I guess you could say he worshipped himself, but you get the idea. Faceless men are some of the most highly trained, highly sought after, highly feared assassins in the world. And I just want to remind everyone that the weekly book giveaway is still going, so all you have to do to enter that is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video. If you're just finding me for the first time, you have no idea what's going on. I do weekly Game of Thrones videos. Tomorrow I'm going to do a Q&A video for this video where I'll announce the winner of the giveaway. So history of the Faceless Men. The religion came first, the worship of the many-faced god. It originated in the Valyrian slave mines. This is old Valyria, pre-Doom. The tale goes that a man heard all the slaves whispering prayers to different gods for deliverance via death and decided that they were all speaking to the same god. Thus, many gods with many faces became one god with many faces. Eventually, it led to that man giving the gift of mercy or the gift of death to the most desperate slaves. Eventually, he also gave it to the masters, killing the masters. It's rumored that the order grew to the point that they were able to influence the doom in Valyria. Like they were somehow involved in it coming to pass, whether they were granted a boon by the many-faced god or they killed anyone capable of stopping it. That's only a rumor. After the doom, they eventually set themselves up as a proper order in Bravos. Their guild's home, the temple, is called the House of Black and White. In terms of where it's located in Bravos specifically, I already did a big Bravos video earlier this year where I did a detailed map layout of the city, so I'll just add links for that at the end of this video and in the description so you can watch it if you want. Not all people that join the order become faceless men, that's an elite group inside the religion, but women can also become faceless men and children too, in very very rare cases. The different names of the many face god are just based on region. In Kohor it's called the Black Goat, in Yi Ti it's called the Lion of the Night, and in the Faith of the Seven it's called the Stranger. Whenever I first started getting into Game of Thrones as a series, I actually started to wonder if the many-faced god was just another name for different gods in the series, like if the Faith of the Seven were just different aspects of the many-faced god. I tend to believe it the way the books present it, that the many-faced god is just one of the seven, but not all of the seven. I know there's a big debate that's been going on since the books were originally published. Think of it in terms of the Great Other and Roller, the Red God. George R. R. Martin based those two gods on Zoroastrianism, which states that there is a creator who is not present in the world. He's represented by divine beings and great acts of nature. There's no evil that's a part of him, so evil comes from other sources. It's really interesting, in that religion, the word for evil translates to lies. The forces of good try to neutralize evil, so there's this back and forth push-pull thing going on, with the creator being completely distant from it in any physical sense. So for all intents and purposes, if the great other and roller can be different gods, then all the other gods can be different gods too. So moving on, explaining the Faceless One's belief system. Whenever they kill someone, they see it as a mercy. They're releasing someone from the burden of life. The death of the target is like a sacrament to the many-faced god. In the temple, they also allow people to come in and commit assisted suicide by drinking poison. Whenever someone wishes to kill themselves, they just come in, barter for a price, and the Faceless Ones give them the poison in a black cup. So some other big rules state that when you enter the order, you forsake your identity, and you're only allowed to kill the targets that you're hired to kill. You couldn't just go out murdering anyone you wanted, unless someone named them to you, like Arya named to Jack in, in Season 2. So the House of Black and White, their temple, has a bunch of different levels. They're all really interesting. On the main ground level area, there are statues to over 30 different gods. People could come in and light candles or just stay in worship. But this is also the area where people come to seek help buying poison and killing themselves. It's not a church though. They don't hold services like you see in the Faith of the Seven. Priests can assist people when requested though. So then you go down to the first sub-level. That's where the priests and the acolytes sleep. Then below that is where the servants sleep. Then on the third level, there's the Holy Sanctum. This is where they keep all the faces that they collect. They collect and preserve the faces of the people that come to them to die, and then use those faces as disguises. Part of their training is mastering the ability to use them, like when we see Jacken change his face at the end of Season 2. Like I said, everyone is required to give their name up whenever they join the Order, but there are several important people. There's the Kindly Man, the Handsome Man, the Fat Fellow, the Stern Face, the Squinter, the Lordling, the Starved Man, 
Plague Face, The Waif, and The Alchemist. There's no telling how the show is going to treat these characters or if it's going to cast any of them, so I'm just going to wait till we actually start seeing episodes or casting notices to talk more about them. But they're not a massive group of people, like the Faith of the Seven or the Order of the Red God. Like, they don't try to go out and convert people to their religion. That's why, largely, they're just localized to Bravos, like their home base. So a big part of hiring them to kill people is the bartering process, and it just depends, the cost just depends on how important the person is that you want them to kill. They will kill anyone though, anyone in the world, king or peasant. It's just that the price for killing a king or queen is astronomical. They do accept more than just money though, in exchange for a contract. It might involve some non-monetary thing of really high value. Thus far on the show, we haven't seen a whole lot of faceless men, but in the books, where we are in the story on the show, they actually have come up several times. In the first book, Robert Baratheon's small council thinks about hiring a faceless man to kill Daenerys. This was all before the dragons were born. They decided not to, just because it was too much money. In book two, Arya of course meets faceless man Jack and Hagar. In book three, whenever Arya is with the Brotherhood Without Banners, an old woman called the Ghost of High Heart tells a story where she said in a dream she sees a man without a face waiting on a bridge that swayed and swung. So there are some things that the show has not done, but remember, at the end of season two, whenever Jacken left Arya, he gave her the Bravosi coin and taught her that she could give it to any Bravosi ship captain and say the words Falar Margolis, and they would take her to Bravos. It's like a Willy Wonka golden ticket to WTF land, and you can just see the excitement on Arya's face as she's on the boat on the way to Bravos. But there's also this really sinister connotation behind it, just because of the meanings of those words. In High Valyrian, it means all men must die. The formal response, Valar do Aeris, is all men must serve. I like to think of the exchanges meaning all men must serve death, but that's just my interpretation. So in my previous video, I posted a picture from a new filming location that looked kind of like Bravo, so we weren't really sure. There have been a bunch more pictures since then. None of the characters that they announced to Comic-Con were Bravosi characters, but Maisie Williams did call herself No One on the panel, which is something right out of book four. So it sounds like the show is going to do a version of Bravos, maybe a truncated version. It won't be exactly what's in the books. They'll probably just shrink down the number of characters and the house of black and white till it's just a smaller part of the story. It's possible that they'll make casting announcements for Bravosi characters as they start to film those scenes. I think I mentioned it earlier already, but the Child of the Forest from the finale last year, she wasn't cast till November, so they'll continue to make casting announcements for the next couple of months. I'll be sure to mention any of them as they come along. So like I said, there will be a Q&A video for this tomorrow, so be sure to send me all of the questions. Since I finally had my last day at my job Friday, I can spend more time talking to you guys, so please do ask questions so I can answer all of them. So like I said, you can click here for the link to that Bravos video where I go into that detailed map breakdown of all the different buildings in the city. And you can click here to get the Q&A video. I'll have the annotation as soon as I post it tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. High fives.